Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk about the best of Bruckner's worst. I'm talking about Symphony Number no. Zero, which really was never called Number no. Zero by Bruckner. He just said it was not valid and that it was annulled and that it was a worthless piece of garbage. Man, he didn't say that. I said that. But Bruckner was right. It is horrible. It's a terrible piece of music. This, of course, has not stopped Bruckner cookies from, you know, claiming ridiculous things about it. And, of course, from desperately seeking to include it in the canonic nine or eight and a half or eight and eight and three quarters or however you want to put it that Bruckner actually finished. Never mind the millions of other versions of those eight and three quarters that Bruckner actually finished. Here's the deal with symphony number zero, as we call it. I love the fact that we call it the zero because that's about what it's worth. Zero. Why is it? Here's the point, I think. Why is it that everyone, especially Bruckner supporters, has to believe that they were smarter than Bruckner. Now, don't get me wrong. Composers are not always the best judge of their own work. But here's the thing. People are always willing to second guess Bruckner when it comes to not paying any attention to the decisions that he actually made. In other words, Everything that he did was the result of some sort of contingent circumstance. He was neurotic. He was insecure. Someone didn't like something. He had a nervous breakdown. So he had to revise everything. And he was forced and pushed and coddled and schmoozed and stuffed. And and, and so we have to write this wrong. And that's that's what makes what makes Bruckner people such obnoxious loonies for the most part because they think they're on this self-righteous crusade to to do what's right by their hero, you know, who was who was terribly wronged in his life. When the fact of the matter is he wasn't treated differently from any other composer. And he went through the same things that every other composer did. And he revised things based on hearing them and deciding he needed to fix them. And here's the thing that's so amazing about it. He was a composer of genius. He really was. And I can tell you that I respect him more than any of the Bruckner people because I respect the decisions that he made. And I I take them seriously. Bruckner apparently wrote this symphony somewhere between the first and the second symphonies around 1869. And when he gave it to Otto Dessoff, who was then conductor of the Vienna Philharmonic, Otto Dessoff said to him, uh, looking at the score, presumably because nobody could play it, where is the first theme? <laughs> because it has no first theme. He was right. The first movement is probably the worst single piece of music that Bruckner ever wrote. And as a result of that, the Bruckner people tell us, he had a complete nervous collapse, <laughs> a total fit of insecurity, and and he never had the symphony played or performed, and he put it aside. And then in 1895, when he was going through all of his manuscripts, he pulled this thing out, and he looked at it, and he wrote, not valid, annulled. It's not part of my canonic bunch of symphonies. And it's perfectly understandable why. I mean, all you have to do is listen to it. And you think, oh my God, this is awful. Does it sound like Bruckner? Yes, it does. But it sounds like bad Bruckner. It does the things Bruckner symphonies are supposed to do badly. And that's the point. That's why Bruckner annulled it. Now, does that mean we can't listen to it today? No, it doesn't. Does it mean Bruckner was wrong? Also, no. If somebody enjoys something against the composer's wishes, that's that's their privilege. I mean, the thing has been published. It can be performed. It doesn't make any difference. You know, everyone can like what they like. But let's not kid ourselves. This was not some sort of some sort of a mistake on Bruckner's part to not accept this poor, lonely little lost symphony. He was right. It's garbage. It's dreck. It's awful. And I'm going to play you the opening. I'll tell you exactly why it's awful. 
I'll tell you why. I mean, any, any, it's not rocket science. Anybody who listens to the opening of the first movement will know exactly why this symphony is horrible. So I am going to play it for you right now, and then we'll talk about just how bad it is. I want you to listen to it. Here is one of the better performances of it. This is Georg Tintner, who's a passionate advocate of the symphony, who feels that it was definitely the work of those nefarious critics who told Bruckner that, you know, he wasn't doing wonderful things, even when he wasn't doing wonderful things. And and so, you know, it deserves special pleading, and he's going to give it his all, and he does. He gets a wonderful performance. It's a beautiful performance. Here is the first and second subject of the first movement. You're ready? Here we go. that awful? Wasn't that just horrible? Why is it horrible? Let's think. Let's think about it. First of all, it is as plodding and uninteresting an opening as Bruckner ever wrote. Just blum, 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 blum. Remember the opening of the first symphony, which is similarly a march. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, how much more interesting is the opening of the first symphony than that? I mean, the difference, of course, is that the opening of the first symphony has a tune. This does not. This just goes jugga 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 and it just repeats itself at different pitch levels for about a minute and a half. I mean, that's all it does. But there is no theme. And one of the things that we notice about Bruckner, it's really very interesting, is that he tended to think in sort of blocks of harmony in sound blocks, if you want to call them that. And when he revised his symphonies, aside from the issues of like cuts and things like that, one of the things he always did invariably was to make his music more thematically interesting. He would add a brass fanfare. He would change the actual shape of the melody. He would do things to try and give the music more melodic interest because his initial thoughts were usually just in terms of, of harmonic spaces and juxtaposing these harmonic spaces to create a movement. And that's what he did. That was his technique. 
And it was a radical technique, a fascinating technique. But he realized as he thought about things and revised things that sometimes the music just needed to be more interesting. That's what he did, for example, in revising the Third Symphony. And one of the reasons he made cuts later on in some of these works is he realized when, when sections had thematic interest, they didn't need to be as long. And they didn't need to be they didn't need to be repeated as frequently. Why? Because you remember the tune. You remember a tune much more than you're gonna remember jugga 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 you know, which takes a lot longer to make an impression on you as a harmonic statement than a really captivating melody will. And that was sort of the the duality in Bruckner's work that he struggled with his entire life. It's a fascinating topic, it really is. But it's it doesn't doesn't excuse the fact that sometimes he just didn't get it right, as in this symphony, because this is a transitional work. He's moving from the style of the first symphony to the more mature Bruckner-ish style of the second and third symphonies. This was a D minor symphony. Everybody agrees that when he canceled this symphony, that the real D minor symphony was the third, which however many problems it has with additions and whatnot, people generally regard as a masterpiece. Why do they regard it as a masterpiece? Well, one of the reasons is because it has the trumpet tune. That's what made Wagner love it when Bruckner dedicated it to Wagner. It has captivating melodic and thematic ideas, whereas this symphony, at least the first movement of it, does not. Now, once we get to the second subject, which I marked here so that you can sort of get an idea of what's going on, that stupid plodding rhythm, bum, 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 just keeps going through the whole second subject. It is as constipated rhythmically as anything Bruckner ever wrote. It's stiff. It's it's boring. It's monotonous. It's just bad music. What more is there to say? So if you get off to a horrible start, you're not going to make anything better of the rest of the movement, and Bruckner doesn't. Now, the second movement is nicer because Bruckner was always good in slow movements. It's very pretty. The scherzo sounds a lot like the scherzo of the first symphony. You know, it's one of those tramp, 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 Rossini kind of things. You know, and it has sort of an, an Italian style tune too. I like the scherzo. Bruckner was good at writing scherzos. And the finale also is not so bad. It really isn't. It, it, it's, it's for Bruckner finales, it actually has this sort of slow introduction that gropes around going nowhere. But once it gets moving, it, it moves fairly well. So I, I don't think that it's a complete disaster in the way that the first movement is. But it's, Brook, this is Bruckner's shortest symphony. I mean, performance takes like 38 to 40 minutes on average. It, it's, it's, it sounds just sketchy and inadequate. Also, because Bruckner never got a chance to rework it because he canceled it. <laughs> he annulled it. He didn't give it. I mean, even the, the first symphony, which had no structural changes. I mean, there's a, a war going on because of the fact that it exists in two versions. And of course, the Bruckner people invented an even earlier, early version because you, two versions isn't enough when you can have three, you know? So, so this symphony never really, never really took wing. I don't believe it was ever finalized. I don't think it reflects Bruckner's final thoughts about what it should be. I think he thought it was better off just to discard it because it was a failure and write the Third Symphony, which is wonderful. And aren't we glad he did? Imagine if we'd have to deal with this thing instead of the Third. So don't get me wrong here. I, I don't have a problem with people who enjoy it because everyone has a right to enjoy what they want. I don't have a problem with, with the, the Brucknerites thinking that, you know, they want to hear every scrap that the master wrote. And this certainly qualifies as a scrap. And so they can listen to it and enjoy it. But you can't make extraordinary claims for it. And that's what bothers me. You know, it's a question of, of quality and taste. And, and these are not, you know, I mean, they're obviously subjective. People like what they like. But, you know, you should be able to recognize great Bruckner and sucky Bruckner. There really ought to be a difference because it's really fairly simple to recognize the problems. The problems with Sucky Bruckner are rhythmic rigidity, pointless repetition, <laughs> failures of timing. I mean, you know, that's, that's what this opening has.
Those are its qualities. They are primarily negative. And so, yeah, this is a piece of junk. But if you're a Bruckner Pookie and you like everything Bruckner wrote because Bruckner wrote it, by all means, knock yourself out. Love it. It's okay. And you might like it. I don't know. I just think it's dreck. I really do. And, and because life is too short, I mean, really, all the great music we have that we can listen to, so much of it out there, so much of it's wonderful, so much of it is indisputably masterful, even by Bruckner. Why would you want to listen to this? I mean, isn't, isn't eight and three quarters symphonies in various versions enough? I mean, wh where does it end? You know, I mean, it's, it's enough. It's absolutely enough for me. Maybe not for you. Maybe you need more. Bruckner people always want more because there can never be enough. But really, for me, this is a bridge too far. I, 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 and that's how I feel about recordings, by the way. It's quite similar to the situation with the first symphony. You know, the first symphony, there really are no bad recordings of it. Why? Because only committed Bruckner people play it. There are very few singleton recordings. It always comes within the context of a Bruckner cycle. And the people who had real feelings for it, um, you know, generally do it very, very well. And so it is with this. It's even more so with this because there are even fewer recordings of it. Most Bruckner cycles don't even include it, although recently they do. They also sometimes include the study symphony, which I don't even count as bad Bruckner because I don't count it at all. It was a school exercise and that's all it is. So it, it has no other other claims to mastery, whereas this thing has the great misfortune of sounding somewhat like Bruckner, only not good Bruckner. And that's the problem with it. But, you know, let's talk about a few recordings. I just picked out three because it doesn't matter. If you get a complete cycle that has number zero, it's going to be fine. It's going to sound like a zero, no matter what you do with it. So this was, of course, Tintner, which is perfectly great. And then there was, here's Skrovachevsky, which is perfectly great on Ohms. And then there's, of course, Schulte with the Chicago Symphony. I think this is the best of all. This is my however performance because Schulte did really great early Bruckner. Why? Because he just plays it fast and exciting and he doesn't mess with it. And he's got the Chicago Symphony, which is fantastic. And it just sounds great. So, I mean, you know, for, for, for number zero, I would go with Tintner if you have it. But it comes with the original version of the eighth, which is horrible. And not the performance, the original version is horrible. And and this thing, Schulte's. I mean, and, you know, Barenboim did it. A few other people did it. Who cares? You'll get it. You'll have it. You'll listen to it. You may like it. You may not like it. It doesn't make any difference. It's not great Bruckner. And there's no shame in admitting it. We really ought to just call a spade a spade and say, listen, Listen, this is just not his best work. And that's why he discarded it. And I think he was so right. Why don't we trust him? Why don't we trust his judgment? And with that, my mind having been completely blown by this nonsense, I leave Bruckner's Symphony Number no. 0 where he left it in the waste bin of Brucknerian history. That's where I think it belongs. But who am I? It's your call. It's your life. It's your time. It's 38 minutes that you'll never, ever get back. I've heard this many 38 minutes worth. And my opinion of it has not changed. So keep on listening, folks. But take Bruckner seriously. Listen to what he wanted you to listen to, rather than what you think he should have told us he wanted us to listen to. Bye-bye. Have fun.